I've spent about 15 odd years designing things for the near future, as in how is it that we're going to live on Moon or Mars 10 years from now, 15 years from now? How are we going to transport ourselves on those planetary surfaces? What kind of spacesuits would you need? What kind of suit boards do we need to design? just briefly tell you what I've been doing for the past 20 plus years since I left NID. So I've spent about 15 odd years designing things for the near future, as in how is it that we're going to live on Moon or Mars 10 years from now, 15 years from now? How are we going to transport ourselves on those planetary surfaces? What kind of spacesuits would you need? What kind of suit boards do we need to design? I spent after that, I spent about seven years launching things on rockets. I did a bit of space diplomacy, soft diplomacy, where I had to go against a US embargo of 1998 to open up the US launch market for India. So when we, we launched Google's first satellite on the PSLV as part of that effort. So whenever you hear if PSLVs launch 104 satellites, 96 order American. That wouldn't have been possible had I not taken the time to meet diplomats in both countries and see how we could overcome the embargo to make it happen. So from being a designer, um, I've also spent time doing international business development for the space station program, um, to being a space diplomat of some sort. In the last three years, I've been worrying about climate change. So what, we, what my company in India was trying to do, so I've, I've had three companies. The first one was in San Francisco. It was called Moonfront. The second one was called Liquifer in Vienna. We celebrated our 15th anniversary last year. And the one I started in India when I moved back in 2008 is called Earth to Orbit. Um, so I grew up with the pioneers of the Indian space program. My dad was one of the first recruits in the late 60s when he moved back from Germany and Sarabhai was setting up the team. So quite literally, I grew up with the pioneers of the space program in Ahmedabad. I grew up with TV grabs of the first Apollo landing, for example. My dad used to be in Canada then. What you see here is a beautiful photograph by Henri Cartier-Bresson. It's in Thumba. Our first experimental rocket launch happened in 1963. Not many people are aware of it. The Indian space program is one of the oldest in the world. Remember, Yuri Gagarin went up in 1961. Sputnik went up in 1957. And 1963, India did its first experimental rocket launch in Tumba. The other big influencer in my life growing up was architecture. The Ahmedabad I grew up in, if I may say, was quite different from the Ahmedabad that we have today in, in very many ways. I grew up among people who were architects, children of architects, patrons of architecture. The Cotton Malona families in Ahmedabad, you know, the Sarabhais and the Lalbhais and the Shodans and the Hathi Singhs, they would bring in some of the finest contemporary architects of the times, whether it's Doshi, Korea, uh, Corbusier, Louis Kahn. And I grew up with a good dose of both space and architecture. And if you put the two together, what you have is space architecture. It's sort of an invented discipline. There was no such thing as space architecture. It took us, so I've lived in four different countries. When I was in California, I was part of a small group of people that was trying to make space architecture a recognized discipline within the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. It took us a good 20 years to make that happen because the engineers didn't want it to be recognized as an acceptable professional discipline. I worked on shuttle Mir missions. How many of you are familiar with the space shuttle? The Americans had a fleet of four space shuttles, and the fleet retired in 2011. And since then, the Americans don't have a human ferry. How many of you are aware of that? So Mir was a Russian space station which was up in orbit for about 15 years. So when I started working professionally, by the way, I started working on 
what I would call perceived problems of living and working in microgravity while I was still in high school. For every 10 letters I would send out with design ideas to universities, to NASA, to ESA, I would hear back from at least two or three of them, which is what kept me going. And this is pre-NID. NID happened later. Um, so the Mi space station and the space shuttle, uh, I'm emotionally very attached to these two spacecraft because I kind of know them inside out. And what you're looking here is a beautiful view of Space Shuttle Atlantis from one of the pristine windows on the Mir space station. You know, the Russians, what they do is they have amazing, these big, beautiful mechanical covers on their windows. So even after many, many years in space, they're, they're quite beautiful. I mean, this is one of my shots. I love windows. And, and windows have always been a bone of contention between engineers and designers because they're a very vulnerable part of your module, right? The module skin, where you puncture in a window, is a very vulnerable part of the space station. So the American module on the space station that's orbiting while we sit here, it has one window, the, the, the American module. The main Russian module has 14 windows. So I mean, I just give this as a quick example to show you that the American and Russians approach human spaceflight very differently. I mean, that's a whole different lecture, but just as an example. That's the International Space Station, guys. The first module went up in 1998, the year I started working for Boeing. And this is roughly the size of two football fields, and 16 nations have sort of come together to build different parts of the space station. And what you're seeing here are the solar panels um, the sort of the dark ones, and the white ones are the thermal radiators because you have to pump heat out of the station and cool it. This station orbits the Earth once every 90 minutes. I'll show you a few um, images just to get your heads wrapped up around what do these habitats, what will they look like? This is a concept of a hybrid moon base where you have both inflatable, rigidizable elements you take it up on a rocket, you deploy it, you inflate it, you rigidize it, and solid parts, and it's built using what we call piecemeal architecture, so you need several flights to bring this together. Yet another concept. This is subterranean. The lava tubes on the moon can be a great place for us to actually build into the tubes. See, the moon has no atmosphere, right? Uh, by the way, what I like about designing for living in, in outer space, uh, the reason I like it so much or enjoy it so much is you can't take anything for granted. You can't take gravity for granted. You can't take atmospheric pressure for granted. You can't even take natural illumination and the colors that it brings to you on this planet because you have an atmosphere. On the moon, everything is black and white and gray. The lunar dust is unlike if you go on a beach and look at a grain of sand, it's rounded off because you have weathering forces, right? Wind and flowing water. On the moon, you have none of this. So lunar dust is very fine, very sharp, like glass. And it gets into everything. It gets into the creases of your suit. It gets into the, into the creases, of, into the mechanical parts of your buggy. If you bring it into your habitat, you breathe it in, it sits in your lungs. So it's a, it's a big problem. I think living on the moon for the average scientist or geologist that's not what I foresee will happen. I think it'll be construction workers and miners and maybe bioengineered humans who will be living on the moon, not you and I. It's a, it's a treacherous environment. I, I cannot go into the details of the design, but I'll just give you impressions. And whatever we design, we have to test it, right? So for simulating lunar gravity, which is about one-sixth, we do our testing underwater. What you're seeing here is a project that my Vienna company was involved in. And the rover, the spacesuit, were all part of the design um, endeavor. And we are testing it here in the south of France, in Marseille, at the facilities of one of our partners called COMEX. Not only are we testing the rover and a new kind of spacesuit, we are also testing communication protocols between the human and the, and, the, and the robot. 
you have to design all of those as, I mean, as a designer, you not only design hardware, you also design things like protocols. For each of these projects, we go through a lot of scenarios. We do scenario building in the initial phase of, of, of this, each of the designs. You know, we have to look at, I'll, I'll come to that, maybe in another of the slides. This particular slide, um, you're seeing a concept which my Vienna company designed or developed in partnership with the European Astronaut Center in Cologne for a future 3D printed Mars space. So 3D printing is becoming fairly mainstream in the sense my company in Vienna, we have a printer where we actually spit out scale models of whatever we are designing, but that's the easier part, the simpler part. For this kind of 3D printing where you take in situ regolith, moon, Mars, wherever you're going, and use that to build parts of your habitat. We are currently in the lab phase where we are able to build small parts using simulated uh, lunar regolith, for example, using lava casting and sintering techniques. So once that gets out of the lab, we can actually be building. It's in, in a way, it's kind of Adobe, but using 3D printing uh, techniques. Here, too, you will see that we've used uh, leftover parts from the descent module. So it's always you have to scavenge what you br bring to the planet, use some of that, instead of throwing it away. The other interesting thing is the suit port. I'll talk about it in one of the other slides. So this is a concept which we also build a prototype of. Uh, it's a, we often use biomimetics in our design. We take inspiration from nature to design things because what happens is at the end of the day, whatever you design has to sit on top of a rocket. We call it the fairing bay. It has to be accommodated on the top of the rocket. It will fly. And once you land, you can deploy whatever you've designed. Like this particular thing is designed for a crew of two astronauts. And when outfitted, it can still be folded back like the petals of a flower. And it can be deployed back again. Um, what you see in the background, I'll show you a video later on, but that's a rover that we designed for both Moon Mars exploration. By the way, each of these projects, wherever you see a prototype, takes about three years. Um, so when we started our Vienna company, the idea was that we will take a multidisciplinary approach to design. We will have industrial di designers, architects, engineers, scientists, ergonomists working together. Unlike the NASA's of the world, which is usually, it's, it's mostly engineers. Um, so when we started off, this was in 2004, the general notion was that, oh, these guys are architects and designers. We can have pretty pictures for PR, right? They didn't, they didn't have the confidence that we can actually build things. So I think the fact that us designers, doesn't matter which, what your discipline is, unless you prototype, you're not, sketching is good, scenario building is good, but unless you can prototype and test, the engineers are never going to take you seriously. So I think now we've built enough for them to understand, and now they've seen how we are able, it takes about three, four years for your small team to develop a sort of rapport where you're able to communicate effortlessly, right? And not only while you're sitting in the same room across from each other, but also if you're in different countries and talking to each other on Skype. So what I'm trying to say is communication is a very important part that you refine over time within your team. It, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, by the way, we also have to write a lot of proposals to raise funding for each of these projects. Like something like this would take anywhere from three million euros to four million euros, right? And what you were seeing in the previous slide was we're testing the habitat and the rover and the spacesuit in Spain in a place called Rio Tinto where the terrain is like Mars. So this is something what we call an analog site. In addition to habitats and rovers and spacesuits, we also design things like simulators where you simulate planetary emissions. We design um, protocols, like I said. We also design greenhouses, for example, because when you are on long duration missions, uh, say on Mars and stuff, you'll have to grow your own food. 
This is a photograph from my trip to Antarctica. The reason I chose to show you this is when we were out there, so getting to the Arctic is very easy. You can sort of get to the Swedish Arctic or the Norwegian Arctic by land. Um, getting to Antarctica is a whole, other, a whole other gig. You have to pass through what's called a Drake Passage if, you, if you're sailing from Argentina. And if you look at the globe, at that latitude, you don't have any landmass. So the winds really whip up your ship and you, you're just being tossed around for 48 hours. The Drake Passage is one of the most violent passages uh, in the, on the ocean front, right? And once you're in Antarctica, while you, you might think that this is beautiful, it is. It gives you a million shades of blue. But being in Antarctica is also very disorienting. I mean, it's at, at once sublime, but it's also savage, the beauty. And it starts to do things to your mind. How many of you watch science fiction films? Have you seen Solaris, for example? You have. So I think Antarctica, and I, I, I highly recommend um, you guys taking a trip to the Arctic. It's not going to last very much longer. I think probably another 10 years. The Arctic is melting very fast. Even when we were in, in Antarctica, while we were sitting on one of our landings, I was part of a cultural expedition, guys. Uh, you've heard of scientific expeditions and scientific bases in Antarctica, but I was invited to be part of the first Antarctic Art Biennale, which was organized, which was the dream of this crazy Russian artist, Alexander Ponomarev. So we were a shipload of about 20 artists from around the world, and a bunch of interdisciplinary guys such as myself, divers, philosophers, filmmakers. It was not only an eclectic trip, I think it was also mind-bending in very many ways. So we were sitting on one of our landings, and you could hear this loud explosion as if a skyscraper is being detonated. It was nothing but icebergs calving. And you know, when that happens, and it, it's happening quite a bit now and in an accelerated fashion, the glaciers accelerate, they melt in an accelerated fashion. So Antarctica used to be tropical, by the way. Why is Greenland called Greenland? Um, because it was green at some point. Antarctica was also tropical at some point. If you look at geological uh, memory slices, you know, if you look at the supercontinent, India from all the way from Odisha to Kanyakumari was hanging out on the northeastern edge of Antarctica. And then things floated away. So if you go to the geological deposits in my home state of uh, Odisha, you can see the, the glacial melt memory of 300 million years ago. So things keep moving and shifting. But I think what's happening now is the climate change is induced by us, right? If any of you have seen the, the latest David Attenborough series, 96% uh, of mammals on this planet are us. I mean, how scary is that? 70% uh, of all birds on this planet are poultry. By the way, when we were in Antarctica, we did encounter wildlife, and to me, they were not really wild, if you ask me. The, the humpback whales, they were the size, they were longer than the, the width of this room, and they were like 40-ton creatures by the side of your inflatable dingies, you know, like just, you know, kind of breaching the water and having a good time. They don't touch you. I mean, for the first one hour, you're petrified, but then you get used to them. They're very gentle creatures, these beautiful big whales. The penguins, they're nasty. I mean, they're, they're, you, you try to keep your, your distance, but they just walk up to you. They're very cosmopolitan if you, if you take it the positive way. Um, but really, it opens your eyes to what is it that we're doing to our planet, and it's, it's very worrisome. Um, the other thing that worries me, which I've started to work on, is near-Earth environment. I won't talk about it much here, but what we've done to our home planet we're also doing it to outer space. We are trashing it. And there are several constellations coming up. There's already plenty of man-made debris in space. We have 21,000 trackable objects in low Earth orbit. Just to give you a sense, if that's Earth, the Earth observation or remote sensing satellites, spy satellites, weather satellites, they fly in low Earth orbit up to 1,000 kilometers or so. Right? And the comsats, the heavy tonnage comsats, they fly at 36,000 kilometers over the equator. 
right? So technically, you're supposed to push out your ComSat into a graveyard orbit when it gets to the end of its life. Nobody wants to do it. You make a lot of money through uh, your TV broadcasting and all of the other ComSat stuff. So who wants to get rid of their satellite? And the low Earth orbit satellites, you're supposed to deorbit and burn it up like a meteor, meteorite. But we don't have any enforceable laws. So now I'm starting to work on that front. Again, it's more of a space diplomacy thing, but it's very important for the future of this planet.